yeah we are live uh, uh hello uh, good evening everyone uh, uh i welcome you all uh, to uh, another episode of uh, uh, yoc initiative uh, yoc surf, uh, surfing through the anterior segment let me share my screen i will uh, i welcome you all uh, to the another exciting uh, session of uh, surfing through the anterior segment uh, where we today will discuss about three exciting cases of strabismus uh, this is an initiative by the young open society of india where uh, we have mixed bag presentations like case presentation debate quiz uh, surgical and video session it is generally uh, it is on the last thursday of every month at 9 pm this substantially be covered like cataract cornea glaucoma strabismus and oculoplasty uh this is the core team uh, today we have in our panel dr amar pujari dr pratik chogle and uh, dr dibide sir is my co moderator and three presenters now it is my pleasure to introduce my co moderator dr dibide singh sir he is a director of he is director of uh, nobel i care gurugram head of department of ophthalmology at narayan super specialty hospital and he has more than 75 publications and 20 chapters and one book on oct in glaucoma he is currently the president hello he is currently the president of young yoshi and treasurer of ino sir is uh, very famous among uh, young ophthalmologists i welcome you sir now i it's my pleasure to introduce dr amar pujari who is currently working as an assistant professor of ophthalmology at dr rp center aims new delhi sir has interest in works like strabismus lenticular imaging and wet lab training and smartphone innovation sir has immense 130 publications uh, at this age and sir is creation of novel clinic techniques and platforms in wet lab surgical training sir has notable recognitions like professor yasuo tano travel grant aios vision sante award and asia world trophy in dos in 2019 i welcome you dr amar pujari sir sir Thank has very you, innovation Sir has very innovation mind and always looking for new ideas now it's my pleasure to invite uh, our another panelist dr pratik chogle uh, who is the consultant in strabismus in pediatric neurophthalmology at lbpi uh, he has done his dnb from sankar eye hospital and his clinical fellowship from lvpi and clinical research fellowship from the snec singapore he has publication of around 12 publications now i invite uh, dr digby sir to take over i welcome all of you to the another session of surfing the anterior segment and another season actually if you think of it from the for this for strabismus we had a very successful mm -hmm. season as well and uh, and i and the cases that we have this time are pretty amazing i think all of you will really enjoy them so we'll begin our cases and uh, ashwini can invite the first speaker we'll have the case and then we'll have a discussion following that case and then we'll move on to the next case that's how we'll follow ashwini our first our first speaker is dr aishak kanam who is a dnb second year dnb resident at nara netralaya uh who has done his mbba from kasturba medical college manipal uh dr aisha uh, now you will present please unmute yourself so good evening uh, everyone hope you all have a good day and uh, so let's start with the discussion for the first presentation ये 
it is hypothesized that probably a sense of your inflammation is the cause. But in some cases, um, inflammatory Brown syndrome is associated with concurrent sinusitis or rheumatoid arthritis. Right. So, but in majority of the cases, however, inflammatory uh, the cause of the inflammation is unknown. Our case shows rare cause of acquired inflammatory Brown syndrome that is inflammation due to post-surgical uh, post-surgical trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. That was a interesting, wonderful case. One of a, a rare cause for what is an acquired uh, Brown syndrome. Most of the times, the, you know, we get it because of trauma and other causes as well. Uh, Dr. Pratik, you can stop your screen sharing now. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Your comments. Uh so a nice case, good case. It's a, as Dr. Dibuja has already mentioned, it's a rare form of uh, Brown syndrome. Most often it's congenital. If it's acquired, it's usually secondary to trauma. Um, so one thing um, that I would say is that that should have been covered was another important differential diagnosis of Brown syndrome, which is a monoocular elevation deficit, MED. And the important differentiating feature between the, this is mostly for the residents and fellows, the most important point that differentiates between the two is uh, in monoocular elevation deficit, the elevation limitation will be maximum in abduction, whereas in Brown syndrome, it will be maximum in adduction. You can see in the head charting, in your case, the elevation deficit was maximum in the legal elevation that is in the adducted position for the right eye. Now, another important point, mostly for uh, residents and fellows, is it, just like HVF, in uh, diplopia charting and in HES charting, the uh, fields the right test is in front of the right eye of the ex of whoever is reading. So you have to put the right field in front of the right eye and the left field in front of the left eye. So you can see levo elevation, the deficit, uh, the elevation deficit was maximum. So that's why we, that's why she made a diagnosis of Brown syndrome and uh, that's how we differentiated from uh, MED. Um, the other thing is one point you had mentioned was superior oblique overaction is uh, not present in Brown syndrome. It may be present. And in that case, in that case, it will be called as a brown plus syndrome. Okay. Um, another thing that I would like to add here is if in fortunately in your case the inflammation, uh, in case this inflammation does not uh, what we can we need to investigate first of all we need to find the cause in your case it was the atrogenic there is post -surgery, post surgery inflammation due to uh, post surgery. So in this case, if it would have not resolved, we could have given a sh short course of systemic steroids or even uh, peritrochlear steroids have been um, um, described. Recently, a paper from, I think, Dr. Shashikan Chetty from Arvind, uh, a series of cases in which they've given um, peritrochlear steroids, I think, which has given good results. Um, that's it. So good case, uh, could you wait it? And fortunately, it resolved. Good. Uh, sir, uh, unmute. Digvijay, sir. Digvijay, sir, unmute. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Sir. I was asking whether Amar wants to add something to this or Ashwini, if you've got a thought. Yes, sir. It was a nice case presentation. So it was more of, as Dr. Pratik was saying, it was more of a uh, MED rather than Brown syndrome because you can see SR as well as IO under action. And that too, uh, if you see the scar that is quite above as compared to the real uh, location of the trochlea. So it is doubtful that it might have damaged any of the trochlear area because trochlea is quite deep. So even if they are debulking the AV uh, malformation tissue, so it's unlikely that they might have damaged the uh, trochlea or its tendon. So even uh, to cause uh, that kind of brown syndrome, you need to breach the synovial sheath and they should be active fibrosis. So that should prevent the abnormal telescoping of the suprobic tendon within the trochlea. So then we are going to call it as an actual bronze. And as Dr. Pratik was saying, so brown plus can be there in your table, you need to correct uh, when there is a suprobic poor action that needs to be called as a brown plus syndrome, right? So it was a nice presentation. So thank you.
So I think as a, you know, basically as residents, fellows and all of us, you know, Brown syndrome is something that will often come across to us in spotters, you know, and so one should be able to differentiate the two uh, and, you know, be, be able to make a diagnosis or, or at least have a differential diagnosis of Brown syndrome. Uh, you also need to know the basic management, you know, one may or may not actually be getting to operate something like a Brown syndrome during the, your training periods or being able to actually see that, but one should be aware here it got you know, corrected over time on its own, which is good. But in, in most of the cases, you know, we have to end up doing some kind of a procedure for it. And usually it's a surgical procedure. And as we know that it is actually a tight superior oblique or there's, you know, or there's an issue with regard to its telescoping. So that's where we use a certain process such as either a spacer or a chicken suture. Or so you one should be aware of, you know, uh, at least these, though it's not in, for this particular case, but, you know, in Brown syndrome overall uh, for, for completion of the topic, that's important to know. We also, uh, you know, uh, typically need to be able, to, and so, so classic Brown syndrome is usually easy to diagnose, is easy to diagnose, but you know, one also needs to know that you end up with a lot of mimickers that are there. And most of the time, you know, things like thyroid eye disease, for example, is something else that may present with what looks like Brown syndrome. So again, in these cases, you know, the, the force duction test helps very well. So these are different forms of restrictive strabismus and uh, one should be able to do perform a force duction test uh, and also the force duction test for the uh, oblique muscles. And that's different from what it is we do for the recti muscles. So both of that you should have the knowledge of. And I think if from this case overall as a take home message, we can understand the presentation. That's why the case was selected. One that to understand the presentation to discuss the various differentials in such a case. And I think that has come out beautifully because uh, you know, this is not a classic Brown syndrome, but yet you'll, you'll always keep this in a differential diagnosis of such a case that comes across. And uh, so well presented. I think uh, that's good. We'd like to, you know, uh, any thoughts that you have, Aisha, in your case, anything else that you wanted us to discuss? I would like to... Because the, although the uh, region was superficial, and uh, as I told you, maybe the directly trochlea or the tendon might not be involved. But because we operated, and there was, uh, and uh, as the uh, chelation therapy, and after that excision was done, and then post uh, reconstructive repair, that must have led to a lot of inflammation. That might have affected that trochlea or uh, that region. And then uh, we did it. We were thinking in light of that. You were able to follow up the patient yourself. You were, or you were like, God, you were lucky enough to get that chance. So actually, the patient just came three weeks later, and after that, we didn't see him again. So, so just one follow up there after that. He was fine, and then he went in. That's that's usually a happy patient, and he's he's managed. He's okay, so he doesn't need to come back anymore. I would like to add I, some points. So look, everything in Brown syndrome is around. Uh, supra oblique uh, muscle sheath or any uh, fibrosis around it or any tenderness origin or defective origin of trochlea. So everything in Brown syndrome is around that part only. Or if there is, in, there are many theories also like infra oblique, uh, it's related to infra oblique also. So injury to that part may also be uh, a cause of uh, like Brown syndrome, but it, this case was not typical of Brown syndrome, but yes, it is a nice presentation. Yes, one thing is whenever you suspect Brown syndrome, it has to be congenital, right? So you need to take a fat scan, that is family album tomography. So often they are going to be kids in the uh, schools or in high schools. So that's why you are going to pick up the things and some kind of facial anomaly could be there. So you can get a CT scan there. If you're expecting Brown syndrome in an, in an adult patient or acquired condition, you need to rule out cystic circuses first in Indian scenario. Then you need to rule out any kind of orbital inflammation, including your uh, pseudotumor, as well as ethmoidal inflammations. So they can cause some kind of superior nasal problems, like sinus problems, sinus herniation. Even we have seen some mass legends in the superior nasal quadrant. They are coming as Brown syndrome. So it's a quite diverse condition. So whenever you get a question of Brown syndrome, it has to be congenital. It has to be in the kit in classical presentation. So if you are expecting some other adult or unusual conditions, you need to rule out. You can take a 2 mm scans along the orbit and you can find out exactly what is the cause. So once you find out the cause, treatment is easy. You can do surgery. No problem. Good. So uh, what we would uh, uh, 
we'd like to present a certificate to aisha for presentation uh, as well so aarti do we have that if you can share your screen now and uh, then we'll move on to the next presenter Good, thanks. So you're going to clap. Digital certificate from UC side. Why not? I think we should always celebrate all the small. Yeah. Things. I mean, this is a big thing to be presenting on this platform. So definitely, and congratulations, absolutely. And thanks for participating. Thank you. We'll email this to you. Uh, you know, at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Ashwini, we can uh, move on to the next uh, case now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Nitya. Who is currently as an a fellow in the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus in Nara Netralaya, and she has a special interest in the field of strabismus neuro ophthalmology. She has done as MS from the Saint John National Academy of Health. Uh, over to Dr. Nitya. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all. I'm Dr. Nitya. I'll be uh, discussing the next case for today. So we had a 15-year-old male uh, who was a student who gave us history of uh, sudden inward deviation of eyes after prolonged near work. So the father also gave history of increased screen time, and uh, he was in front of gadgets for more than eight to ten hours per day. So he gave history of intermittent double vision, which was horizontal, binocular, present both for distance and near, and it increased with near activity. There was blurring of near vision as well. So on examination, his best corrected visual acuity was 6-6 and N6 in the right eye and 6-6 and N6 in the left eye. Static retinoscopy revealed a myopic refractive error of minus 2.5 diopter in the right eye and minus 3 diopter in the left eye. So we did go ahead with the cyclorefraction. Uh, it uh, showed no, uh, no spherical refractive error. However, a minimal cylinder of uh, 0.5 diopter was noted at one, 180 degree. Cyclo acceptance was 6-6 and N6. Pupil examination revealed meiosis. and slit lamp examination was normal on uh, squint evaluation hirschberg test showed right esotropia of 15 degree cover test showed right esotropia for distance and near uh, it measured uh, about 30 prism diopters for distance and near extraocular movements were full and there was no limitation of abduction in both eyes fundus was normal and there was no disc edema so at this stage uh, we started uh, thinking about the differentials of acute onset esotropia So, if the distance deviation is more than near deviation, it goes in favor of divergence paresis or divergence insufficiency. It is also too important to keep in mind uh, the acute competent esotropia due to neurological cause. So, if the near deviation is more than distance deviation, then it is a convergence excess pattern, and uh, the possibilities will be refractive accommodative esotropia, convergence excess, and spasm of near reflex. So, in our patient, there was no significant uh, neurological history suggestive of any. Um, Uh, you know neurological signs or symptoms nothing was uh, there in this patient and uh, cyclo refraction did not show any hypermetropia so refractive accommodative uh, esotropia was ruled out however it was still inconclusive the distance and near deviation was equal so we went ahead with a uh, detailed orthoptic evaluation so here i would like to present the significant findings and the normative values are by its side starting with the sensory test uh, stereo acuity was 800 seconds of an arc um distance and near worth four dot test showed a diplopia response cover test as i discussed showed a right esotropia ac by a ratio was normal because our patient didn't have a significant difference between distance and near and the near point of accommodation here was 7 cm in the right eye and 7 in the left eye 7 binocular normal range for this age group is around 10 to 11 cm so we did the npa measurement with an raf rule so this was suggestive of the patient being in a state of accommodative excess so further uh, it uh, it was proved by positive relative accommodation 
Uh, here the value was minus 11 diopter, which was significantly high. Uh, we went ahead with the monocular estimation method retinoscopy, MEM retinoscopy, which showed a lead of accommodation. So the normative value is plus uh, 0.25 to plus 0.75. Anything beyond plus 0.75 is a lag and anything less than that is lead of accommodation. And on accommodative facility test, uh, in a plus plus uh, lens, the patient had difficulty in clearing uh, these plus lenses. So the normal uh, value for this age group is uh, 11 cycles per minute. It was reduced in the right eye, it was six, and in the left eye as well, it was seven. So with these findings um, in a patient of uh, age group of 15 year old with a sudden onset ESO deviation associated with the uh, increased near activity and dry refraction showing a myopic refractive error and a cyclorefraction showing no spherical refractive error indicating that it was pseudomyopia and a high positive relative accommodation value and, and lead of accommodation and failure to clear plus lenses on accommodative facility test with meiosis on pupillary examination led to the diagnosis of accommodative spasm with conversion sexes or spasm of mere reflex. So we did get an MRI done to rule out any neurological cause. And it is always better to get an MRI done uh, even in case of a spasm of mere reflex because there can be an organic pathology like a posterior fossa lesion or a midbrain lesion. So in our patient, the MRI was normal. So the management, we started with cycloplegic drugs, that is atropine 1% eye drops twice a day. We advised regarding the side effects and uh, we followed up the patient after two weeks. The compliance was good. Uh, on cover test, the RET was still persistent. It was 30, 35 prism diopters for distance and near. But the PRA still remained high. So this was uh, suggestive of a uh, state of accommodative excess. The patient had not improved. So we decided to add uh, bifocals. So we uh, gave a bifocal of plus 1.75 uh, with the working distance of about 35 to 40 centimeters. And uh, we followed up the patient after three months, and we found out that the cover test still showed RET. Uh, it was 35 prism diopter for distance and 30 prism diopter base out for near. And the PRA was uh, minus 7.5. There was partial improvement in uh, this value. And uh, we did question him about his screen time, but at around that time, uh, online classes had started for him, and it was still six to seven hours per day. So the stimulus was still persistent. So we decided to add uh, accommodative flippers. So about uh, six months follow-up after the flippers, the RET in fact had worsened. It was 40 prism diopters for near and 35 prism diopters for distance. But the PRA had subsided. PRA was uh, minus 3.75. There was a significant reduction, uh, indicating that the accommodative component of uh, spasm of near reflex had subsided, but the isotropia component was still persistent. So for this, we tried occlusion therapy, mainly to bring the isotropic eye into fixation. So we wanted the right eye to fix. So we occluded the left eye for two hours per day uh, for a period of three months. And moreover, this is important to prevent contracture because it has been in a constant state of isotropia. So contracture is uh, a significant side effect and that has to be prevented. So we followed up the patient for, a, for about 18 months with the combination of all these therapies, but the isotropia was still persistent. So we gave the option of uh, botulinum toxin or surgery to the patient. So patients, uh, parents actually decided that surgery is a better option because uh, they didn't want uh, to take the risk of repeated injections and the uh, uh, ptosis being a significant side effect, they chose surgery. So uh, we went ahead with a three muscle squint surgery. Uh, right eye, we performed medial rectus resection of 6.5 mm and lateral rectus resection of 5 mm. Uh, left eye, medial rectus resection of 4.5 mm. This is a preoperative photograph. So post-op uh, six uh, weeks, the patient's uh, Hirschberg was symmetrical. His cover test uh, revealed that he was orthophoric for uh, distance and near. So to conclude, uh, through this case report, we'd like to enhance the stepwise approach to a case of uh, spasm of near reflex. In our patient, there was partial response to cycloplegic and bifocal. However, a complete uh, resolution of the accommodative spasm was noted after we started orthoptic exercises and tried combination therapy but the isotropia was still persisting. So we had to go ahead with squint correction uh, to elevate his double vision and uh, restore uh, good binocular vision. And uh, the patient was uh, happy with his outcome. Thank you. It's again a very interesting case. Nithyar, is something that uh, one has to be sensitive to a potential diagnosis. Um, what was the uh, uh, 
the cyclopedic refraction that you done right in the beginning what is the cyclopedic yes, that you had used at that time so we use cyclopentylate sir all right so you had directly decided to use cyclopentylate typically we, we would uh, i mean uh, think, think of looking at homi homotropine possibly <laughs> ఇట్ Spasm of an ear reflex is something that generally tends to, you know, resolve itself over time. In fact, yes, it doesn't take too long either. So, what do you think? Why do you think your case was different? So, one is uh, the stimulus still was present uh, because uh, the online classes had started by then. So, he said that there's no way he could avoid near activity. Uh, so, that was one thing. Uh, it, it had not completely resolved, but definitely yeah, subsided. So, probably that's the reason uh, he's converging more for the accommodative stimulus that he's had. and what was the total timeline between his first presentation to you till you kind of went in for surgery yeah. so we followed up for a period of about 18 months we did give him that time because there are case reports which says that uh, people have recovered uh, in one year one in one year three months so we did give him that time and then decided about surgery only after about 15 months right. so generally what happens is in these cases you know once the isotropy has been persistent for a for a certain period of time then it so the longer it persists the more unlikely it is for it to recover spontaneously essentially and that's why you know you end up often end up going in for surgeries i had a similar patient once which you know uh, but of course there we we went in for atropine very early in the process but despite that you know it did get better but did not completely so i think to an extent they have some kind of a you know, partial response usually yes. but uh, uh, have you seen such cases amar uh, yes sir uh, it's actually uh, sir one point i want to make is uh, dr inta it's actually uh, very elaborately uh, worked up case but the thing is like one thing i want to say is like whenever a 15 year old uh, kid or a girl presenting with uh, isotropy you need to rule out intermittent isophoria first it could be intermittent isophoria that has manifested as uh, isotropia right so second one is acute committent isotropia that you have ruled out and you have done imaging and second one is accumulative spasm spasm is quite rare at 15 years right so we have seen that when patients are coming when we put the atropine ointment for refraction that will give a refractive value as well as that will act as a treatment because once you paralyze the ciliary body muscle it will uh, leave off its function so automatically whatever spasm is there that is going to get relieved we see occasionally these kind of patients but uh, we have now seen this kind of cases the patient we are like even after putting cyclopentylate at 15 years cyclopentylate is appropriate but when you are saying accommodative spasm we have gone for atropine ointment that is an exceptional condition right so intermittent isophoria is one condition that you need to rule out and second thing is what i want to say is like you mentioned 800 seconds of arc stereopsis so you need to measure the stereopsis by putting 30 prisms or uh, that means after neutralizing you need to assess the stereopsis yes, without sir. putting prisms you will say 800 prism that is accepted right so you need to put prisms then you need to comment on what is the amount of uh, uh, stereopsis right and uh, dr anu june has raised a genuine question where like she has said for 30 prism isotropia we have operated three muscles so that is quite unusual so right uh, so, okay. yes sir so but the surgeon uh, who's done it like my consultant she prefers her numbers are slightly higher so it's just a surgeon yes, uh, I, i agree i agree everyone has their own this thing yeah. but it appears that like if you go for a uh, uh, normative uh, mathematical model 6.5 for mr and around 5 mm resection of lr itself will give more than 30 percent so yeah. that everyone has individual uh, opinions that we need to respect it but in general in general if you are asking 30 percent one or at the max two muscles are going to be more than sufficient so but uh, the value which was it was worsening isotropia it had almost become 45 like i mentioned at the end of 18 months it was 45 so that's so what I, it could be intermittent isophoria isophoria okay so that has gone to sequential this thing this thing this thing then it has manifested ultimate isotropia yes sir. right so if you need, uh, read one node and there are other different test prism adaptation test and other test have been described for intermittent isophoria so you can go through that one so we can get more knowledge thank really you thanks for one fracture starts to develop over time even though it may not be very obvious but that leads to an isotropia increasing particularly if it's you know persistent isotropia over 18 months would start to it, it, there is a tendency so i think there were that way you were right and i think it was the right decision not to go in for bot- botulinum toxin because it would not have really done its yeah. job yeah <laughs> you know so surgery was the right thing 
And Pratik, you've also been, uh, uh, you've seen such cases? Yeah, I've seen cases with uh, uh, spasm of near reflex, but in my experience, most of them have recovered pretty well with atropine. Uh, never operated any patient with uh, uh, SONR, that is spasm of near reflex. Um, yes, intermittent isophoria, isophoria is, a, is an important differential like diagnosis. Um, a similar case that we, and I mean, I'm just um, kind of extrapolating, but uh, we've operated, I think, two or three cases of cyclic isotropia, which come in cycles like this. They are intermittent diplopia. Patients have intermittent diplopia and all. But eventually, they become constant. And again, after operation, they do well. Uh, this is another thing apart from intermittent isophoria. Uh, one more thing that I would like to, I mean, uh, my personal opinion, but uh, these cases, I would prefer a symmetrical bimedial precession. Um, the reason being that if you're doing 6.5 of MR in one eye along with an LR section, it may lead to some sort of an incompetence. Uh, so that is one concern. But otherwise, all in all, it was a very well-documented, very well-managed case. Great job. Thank you. I think to an extent, you know, in some of these cases, there is also one can take advantage of the law of reciprocal innervation in the sense that, you know, if you are operating on the LR, you actually end up relaxing the MR a little more. So maybe I don't know your consultant thought towards that direction, but that would... I mean, we don't know the thought process that she had as to why she decided to do a little bit of the LR. But uh, it may be that was one of the things she thought of doing at that time. And you know, so she generally prefers bilateral LR. So like Sir said, the bimedial yeah. rectus recession is his choice. Madam generally prefers bilateral LR. Probably the reason she chose this probably was this that she wanted and to. And her numbers are generally higher. So we ourselves get that out. So. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nita, one question though How long did you give atropine? I mean, did you try so we uh, started like initially since there was no response, we added atropine and then bifocals and we followed up for about three we, uh, three months. I'm sorry. So and then we was, gradually tapered using... it. Okay, so sorry, gradually sorry. tapered atropine. Gradually tapered and then homide and then we tapered the cyclopegis. So I would ask the other panelists, do you have an experience where I mean, how long do you usually wait or give atropine in such cases? Because in my case, in whatever yeah. I manage, they usually did well with just once or twice. I have seen few cases when I was at RP Center, when I was working under Professor Ruiz Sakthana, sir. Most of them we tend to do under refraction, under atropine, uh, proper cyclopathy refraction. You remove that precipitating factor, you give atropine drop, and it resolves. I have never seen follow-up patients. We used to call them frequently. But accommodative spasm cases, we do a refraction. We don't used to do on cyclopentolate. We used to do under atropine. After that, you remove the precipitating factor, you prescribe glasses and atropine, and it used to subside. Uh, I never saw any accommodative spasm patient uh, going into surgery. No, I'm asking is how long uh, should we give? Like, is three months okay, or you can even give more? So the thing is, like, when you are expecting an accommodative uh, spasm. So what I said is like what we have seen is like uh, if you give uh, if you put a token ointment, as I said, that will help in assessing the amount of refractive error, and that itself will give some amount of re uh, uh, relief because atropine is not a shock, short acting medication. It's going to act for almost two weeks, so it's effective. It's going to be there for two weeks, even if you put once the ointment. So that's how it is going to work. So for two weeks, patient is not going to have any diplopia because his accommodation is blurred. So that's how it uh, inhibits the accommodation and that's how it acts as a uh, therapeutic agent also in addition to diagnostic testing. Dr. Nitya, that is a well-managed case and that is very curious. And some people have very curious questions. <laughs> Dr. Apeksha Agarwal is asking, if it was an accommodative spasm to start with, why wasn't isotropia resolved or reduced on first visit after cycloplasia? So Dr. Apeksha, so probably it is not accommodative spasm. Or it could be a cognitive spasm component along with uh, isophoria, intermittent isophoria, or it could be uh, high AC by A ratio, right? So it's a mix or complex condition. It's very difficult to define, but Dr. Nita and her colleagues have managed it very well. Uh, may I add something? Yeah, sometimes what happens is even if you take out the accommodation, the drive for accommodation may still be present. Yeah. And if the drive for accommodation is present, the convergence will follow. In the accommodation, yeah. mind you, has been taken care of by pharmacologically, I mean, by yeah. through the pediatrics uh, or cycloplegics. But the cut drive may still be present because it is central. And mm -hmm. if that is present, then the convergence may still be present. The other thing is there are case reports in which they say that the spasm of near reflex may be due to 
psychogenic problems. It may not, it's usually not an organic yeah. problem, it's a psychogenic problem. And in such cases, adding even psychogenic, uh, I mean, uh, psych anti psychiatric medications like diazepam and all have also helped. So, probably, if I don't know whether I've answered your uh, question correctly, but uh, the probably the drive was still there, and that's why the isotropia still persisted. Uh, so I would just like to add one thing, uh, which I forgot to tell. So we did ask about this, about the psychological illness, or does he have any stress uh, with respect to his exams and all that. But by then, uh, this online classes had started, and uh, the child was slightly stressful about the online activity itself. So he would spend about nine, 10 hours per day in front of the computer. That itself was an accommodative drive. That itself was a drive. And he was just in no position to avoid it. So I think that is what is probably aggravated. And then he started becoming... Yeah, good. Sorry. Yeah, he started becoming um, a non-compliant towards atropine because he couldn't see well. Until then, they had holidays and he was quite comfortable. So that's when we had to actually take off. Um, I would also like to ask the panel, how, how is your experience with uh, smartphone-induced isotropias? Uh, sort of because of the constant use of smartphones. Has anybody come across these things? So at RP Center, in the month of January and February, we were like, lockdown was quite uh, relaxed. So in that duration for around two months, we saw around six to eight cases. So okay. who had this kind of this thing, but automatically once we said that try to avoid uh, near activity and try to relax, try to look for distance, try to do some ocular exercises, they got relieved. So we didn't see any kind of intractable or non-treatable accommodative spasm. Because even if you see uh, the younger kids, like less than four or five years, they will hold the mobile screen very close to their face, like around 10 to 15 centimeters. But uh, the kids who are going to high schools, like more than 10 or 12 years, like in this case, 15 years, they won't hold the mobile that close to face. So obviously they are going to use it more than 33 centimeters. So it's quite unusual that they might be having uh, this like smartphone has induced some kind of accommodative spasm. It can happen because individuals are different, but that that is quite, uh, I feel it's rare. I have recently uh, came across a patient uh, here uh, who is going to appear his board exam 10. He has constant headache. Uh, he has uh, shown in two, three places, uh, constant fundus, is, everything is normal. His automated refraction shows minus one. When I did try to put just tropicamide uh, at the OPD setup, it turned out to be plus two. When it do, we do a cyclopathic refraction, it came out to be plus three sphere or with, with some cylinder. So with cyclopathic correction, what happens in acronym spasm, it tends to be hyperopic shift. Uh, in proper accommodative uh, cases. So we get that power to, and it seems fine as of now. Dr. Ashwini, you can read that question. Dr. Siddhar Seth has some question. Yes, uh, Dr. Siddhar, uh, Dr. Digby sir can answer. Giving bifocals for such patients all, along with atropine in beginning to ameliorate accommodative spasm, particularly for the patients in the age group 14 to 18, where studies remain a triggering factor even with atropine. Uh, what's your comment, uh, sir? That is what I was coming to initially that, you know, so the initial cycloplegia has to be a very strong cycloplegia and bifocals or, you know, uh, small plus glasses, you know, plus 0.5, plus 0.25 can also help in, you know, keeping them from accommodating. Again, more so in cases as pointed out by Amar, where esophorias are there, uh, you know, where accommodation is happening, particularly for near here, we were seeing that it was there both for near and distance. So it kind of actually ended up going into a manifest esotropia all the time. So that's a little different than what we would get. But by but atropine given early on, uh, you know, in, in appropriate dosing, you know, constant use for some time with possibly bifocals, yes, is going to help because he'll be able to do his reading work as well. And he'll and you know, you've achieved a complete cycloplegia. But this case, I suppose uh, I'm sure I mean this is this has been different in terms of how it is, how strongly the spasm was. And uh, if it was, uh, you know, that strong initially, as it is. Yes. But yes, it's a good idea. Kind of give full cycloplegia, give it early. Don't wait for it for too long to just keep sitting. Yes, sir. One thing I want to add is Dr. Siddharth is asking, uh, giving bifocals along with atropine. So we need to understand that bifocals have a different role and atropine is given for different role. If you want to give bifocals, that is going to relax their accommodation. That's it. That has nothing to do with ciliary body, which is already spastic. So if you are giving atropine, it's going to paralyze the ciliary muscles, which is otherwise not going to get relaxed. Even if you close eyes, even patient is like closing his eye for 48 hours, 72 hours, it's not going to uh, elevate this one. So in spasm, you have to break the 
spasmatic spastic muscle that is by giving atrophin only bifocal won't work there if there is a excessive accommodation then you need to give bifocals so there is a different action of bifocals and there is a different action of atrophin prescription in accommodative spasm i thought you were saying to give bifocals to let his online classes go on with it <laughs> Okay, okay. Okay, you are using it as two modalities. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, got it. Got it. I thought you were saying give uh, it to me and bifocals. That the patient will be happy. He'll be able to read his. So I think uh, we'll uh, we'll move on. We to move on to the next case. So Arthi, we can have the certificate. So Nitya, well presented. I think it was a good case, good discussion. Congratulations, Nitya. Thank you, sir. On behalf of you, sir, we'd like to present the certificate. We'll email it to you. And thanks okay. for you know presenting here. All right, Ashwini, we can move on to the next. Yeah. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Subhajit Bhattacharya, uh, who is a consultant in anterior segment and pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, currently working at Bisa Eye Hospital, he has done his residency from RIO Kolkata and fellowship from the pediatric ophthalmology in Sankar Netrala, Chennai. He has multiple teaching video presentation at uh, uh, different conferences. Uh, over to Dr. Uh, Subhajit Bhattacharya. Hello everyone. Good evening. I'm just going to share my see, uh, screen over here. Um, so hello again. I'm Dr. Subhajit Bhattacharya. I'm currently working at Vishay Hospital. So I'm going to uh, share over here an interesting case of a uh, stubborn case of a uh, convergent uh, strabismus fixus, which we had encountered. Uh, so just about a little bit about the topic, uh, strabismus fixus convergence, it's basically eyes fixed in adduction. Commonly, uh, we uh, encounter such cases in high myopia, usually caused by displacement of uh, super rectus and, uh, you know, nasally and lateral rectus inferiorly. And rare, however, rare incidences of non-myopic convergence strabismus fixus of varying etiology has been uh, reported. So uh, we had a, a 23-year-old girl presented with inward deviation of both eyes since birth. With low self confidence, and she had to you know, turn her face in order to make uh, face contact, eye contact. So, on examination, she had both eyes 23 degrees face turn. Um, vision was unaffected. Anterior segment and posterior segment uh, was unremarkable, and she had no refractive error. Her uh, ocular motility, however, as noted on this picture, she had a marked abduction limitation of minus 8 on the right eye and left eye had a abduction limitation of minus 5. Uh, since uh, she couldn't bring her eyes to the midline, uh, you know, the cover test could not be done. Forced by primary gaze, we did a Krimsky and measurement was more than 95 prism diopters. Uh, we uh, did the axial lens, both eyes were comparable. Uh, just, uh, you know, we did an MRI to rule out heavy eye syndrome and assess the presence of lateral rectus. And on MRI orbit, uh, we had uh, seen that uh, the, both the medial rectus, they were thick, hypertrophic, along with the nasalization of vertical recti muscles. The lateral rectus, however, was thin, atrophic, and was present, uh, present in its usual location. And its course was normal, as reported by the radiologist. Uh, now we were wondering how to approach this case. So we did an FDT in the clinic, which was positive as expected. This is the FDT. This was recorded on, on, on table. So FDT, uh, as we see, it was barely crossing the midline. So now how to approach this case, whether to go ahead with a combined or a stage procedure. So we decided to go ahead with a stage procedure, counsel the patient. Uh, on stage one, we planned for a medial rectus recession of both eyes. And stage two, we thought of going ahead with a uh, vertical rectus transposition. So during the stage one procedure, intraoperative FDT was done, which was positive, but it was not so tight. Uh, the medial rectus uh, showed a surprising finding on exposure. It was noted that the medial rectus was, uh, was inserted three millimeters from the limbus. And uh, because there was this anomalous insertion of the medial rectus, we did not do a supramaximal recession of medial rectus. We limited ourselves to 7.5 millimeters behind the insertion, that is around, around 13 millimeters from the limbus. After the recession was done, FDT on table was negative. As we can see on this photo, we, see, we can see that the insertion was, uh, was quite close to the limbus. So the stage one post-op came as to us as a shock. 
the results were unsatisfactory. There was no improvement on abduction. And uh, we counseled the patient. Decision was taken that we'll go ahead with a both eyes superactus transposition of two months. So during the stage two procedure, after two months, we again went ahead with the FDT. And this time it was again another shock. The FDT was tighter even than the previous finding. Barely touched the midline. So we kind of, uh, you know, innovated our decision and we thought of going ahead with a re-exploration of the meter rectus. So on the re-exploration of the meter rectus, we noted that there was a thick fibrous muscular band-like structure, you know, you know, in the location of the meter rectus, which was released. As we can see on this photo, this was the one. This I've marked as it, it as a query because I was not, it looked like, it very much looked like the muscle itself. So after releasing the muscle underneath, we could see the previously recessed medial rectus. On recession of this band, the FDT was still positive. So now a decision uh, was taken on table. Uh, we thought of going ahead with a free tenotomy of the already recessed muscle. And after which finally the FDT was free and the stubborn pull was released. This is the photo. This is the final tenectomy of the medial rectus done. So on retrospection, we went behind on retrospection of the previous, you know, stage one uh, muscle clips, mother, you know, video clips. We went back to see the clips and we saw that during the first surgery, there were these faint bands, as we could see over here, these faint bands, which I had dissected, but probably some bands were left behind, which after closure, but in these two months had become, you know, like these contracted band-like structures. So... So since uh, after the stage one procedure, the FDT was negative. So we stuck to our original plan. We combined the procedure with a superectus transposition along with the Foster's augmentation. So as we can see on these photos, the lateral rectus, this is the Foster's suture, which was passed. The superectus was isolated and SRT was done. This is the final photo. After the stage two photo, thankfully the post-operative alignment was significantly better. The, there was a significant improvement in the face turn. Lateral gazes, however, did not show much improvement. There was a consecutive right eye hypertropia of around 15 prism diopters, which is a known complication of uh, superactus transposition. So we counseled the patient. We went ahead with a final touch. After two months, we had planned for an inferior rectus plication of the right eye. The final stage three procedure looked pretty satisfactory. Uh, the patient was orthotropic on five primary gaze and there was no face turn. Lateral gaze motility, however, was unsatisfactory. So the patient was instructed to turn her head to look sideways. The right eye, there was a small inverse ptosis, which is a known complication of inferior rectus plication. However, it didn't seem to bother the patient so much. So coming to discussion, uh, I'd like to address a couple of uh, points over here. Regarding the etiology, what could be the etiology of these kind of patients? We had, uh, you know, come across some other patients as well in in my OPD. So, uh, so two more I, I I distinctly remember, and we had uh, gone ahead with the treatment as well. So, could it be a bilateral congenital lateral rectus palsy, or could it be a variation of CAPOM? First of all, and another topic I would like to address to the panelists is ki what you know whether we can go ahead with any other treatment options or what would be the best ideal treatment options in these kind of tight muscles. You know, uh, should we stick to the planned uh, you know way of uh, combined recession with vertical rectal transposition or a simple disinsertion would do? As uh, you know, I done in the first first uh, photo, couple of photos. Uh, this is the first uh, patient where I had, uh, you know stuck to the same methodology as the current case. I did the you know bimedial trans uh, you know recession of the, as the first step and uh, left eye SRT as the second step, it, which and the final postoperative outcome was satisfactory. This is another case which uh, you know divergent strabismus fixes. This patient again could hardly you know bring the eye to the midline, and uh, on table the lateral rectus was very tight. So I just did a disinsertion of the lateral rectus on on both sides, and the final outcome was pretty decent. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sumit. So I think uh, another interesting case uh, that we have now here, and uh, you can uh, you know go back to the the initial picture that you yeah. right, that's, uh, one with the 
the differential is not. So uh, maybe uh, maybe yeah, this is the first uh, this is the first picture the surgical picture. So over here. After the retrospectively, what I'd seen was that the medial rectus was isolated; it was recessed, and we can see these faint structures, faint bands, probably which was missed in the first step. So probably these bands were, uh, you know, were some fibrotic structures which had become, you know, which had been triggered some way. And uh, I, I assume that this is probably a case of CFAM, some kind of a CFAM variant, which got, you know, after the first surgery, the muscles got really fibrosed, and you know, and it became these these structures. these How band like structures fdt at the end of the first surgery i mean was it completely free was there still some yeah the fdt fdt was really, was uh, all i mean it was negligible on table so i i was actually expecting a a, a good result after the first stage and this uh, this result was uh, pretty much shocking to me after the first procedure fdt on table was free that's why i left i mean that's why i ended the surgery and this result and what was the next day picture like it was this is the this is this was the, this was the post op picture post op day 1 and this was the first month picture post op first month picture and the lr otherwise any way uh, what, what was the afgt for the lr had you been able to see whether it was having a tug or not uh, anything on the first post op day 1 when the fdt was still free no i mean there was no i mean the lr function was negligible as always it was barely moving i mean it was the, the post operative picture on the first day it was uh, you know kind of the same as the pre operative picture so and uh, there was no uh, the the posterior pole of the so there was no flaying of the two muscles at the back on the temporal side the lr and the ir so sometimes you know the i get the stabismus the typical stabismus fixus picture that we yeah. get you know there is a uh, the globe gets stuck between those two muscles that didn't happen that's what the lr was present at its usual location i mean i this is the this is the position yeah. of the lr the this is this one it was on it was uh, you know a kind of on at its usual location there was no you know even the, even the size shape and the size of the mr was mr's consistency was uh, normal as well L lr basically of the lr of the lr any thoughts uh, pratik amar yes sir so it's a case of basically bilateral isotropism that is not quite a right term but the thing is like when you have this kind of conditions first do indirect ophthalmoscopy if you are able to see high myopic in the posterior fundus this thing so it could be myopic strabismus fixus if it is right. not it's not myopic non myopic strabismus fixus so in that case you want to see what is the location of the sr with respect to lr that is most right. important in case of myopia so you got the mri done but what you what you right rightly pointed is like the sr and the ir both are nasalized so uh, as digvijay uh, sir was stressing so lr was looking uh, quite like thin on mri but uh, surprisingly intraoperatively the caliber of the lr is quite normal here you can see right. in both yeah. the uh, sides lr is quite thin on the mri scan but intraoperatively lr ten appears to be normal so in right. this condition we are going to decide whether it whether it could be ccdd or cfm based on imaging imaging of the brain stem we want to do high definition mr of the brain we can read one of the dr pradeep sharma sir's study in igo so if you are able to see hypoplasia or aplasia of the sixth and nuclei so then you are going to probably mention it as you are going to mention it as cfm congenital fibrosis extramuscular even though there is no uh, uh, fibrosis it's a misnomer so basically some anatomical problem is happening so some chemokines are not able to uh, facilitate the axonal movement so that's why the nerve is hypoplastic or aplastic so that's why subsequently the tendon is underdeveloped so still we don't know whether it's a cause or effect the hypoplasia of the lr so here it could be ccdd we need to do first mr of the brain to see for any uh, nuclear abnormality and we need to do genetic testing tub genes are there there are three variants of cfm you can do that one right so that is one thing second thing is like uh, as you said after doing srt there was a hypertrophy so if you do single vertical recti transposition vertical misalignment is a no complication so right. as here strongly there was a sr and sr ir was nasally uh, misaligned so it have gone for either partial vrt or you have, you have gone for modified nasal aperture so in that condition you are not going to induce any vertical tropias right as the like sr and ir was lying nasally it is it becomes common sense that we need to move them beyond the midline so it have gone for mr recession followed by a partial vrt or modified nasal and third thing point is like as you said some bands were there beneath the mr muscles So, if you read one node and text, what is the etiopathic of isotropia? 
many people have said that they encountered many fibrotic band beneath the rectum muscle if you, you can see some pictures on one on text also so that's a known condition but once you are able to i think you have hooked the muscle completely so it's unlikely that these kind of very minute bands might have caused the uh, uh, residual esotropia so it's because of lack of abductive force that's why that has led to residual esotropia you did mr session that is fine but we need to create some kind of abductive force that can only be done by modified nishida or partial vrt in addition to resisting the agonist tight muscle or the agonist muscle we need to create some abducting force so that will be able to bring the eye in primary position or it it will be able to improve the abduction you got the point right yeah thanks like ultimately the outcome was very nice ultimately outcome was good yes okay. but we need to avoid vertical tropias in a in a post operative you know if you open uh, open a case up after let's say a month or so in the place where the original insertion was you'll often find these fibro tendinous muscular adhesions forming it's right. not unusual uh the only thing is they were pretty tight so my concern probably was that to an extent maybe the ftt could have been freed a little further in the initial step itself because the muscle may have been pretty tight uh secondly uh you know with that you can you can often do a conjunctival recession you can do a tino conjunctival okay. recession actually to you know that also can be a reason for a initial tight ftt just after surgery As yeah, well. that that uh, that's what I've done. And then when I re- researched the conjunctive, I suggested it pretty pretty behind. Pretty behind. So these are the two main things that you could have done. So I don't think there's anything additional you would have probably you know uh, not done in such a case. But though that fibromuscular band is not because it's while it's coming similar to the location as that the whitish bands that you're saying, but it's a little more uh, you know it's, it's bigger and little I would say in a different plane as compared to where they were. It's a little higher. Right. So that is the thought process there. And uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep, what's your thought? Uh, oh, very interesting case, actually. I'm surprised that after removing the S, I mean, uh, recessing the MR so much, you have absolutely no improvement. And uh, probably one thing that I can think of is if the, the MR creeped up back again, or there was extensive scarring post surgery uh, that led to this kind of an addition. Um, Okay, so uh, I am thinking is if you have recessed the MR, there should be some sort of uh, uh, some improvement, but there was absolutely not. So yes, abducting force was uh, gone. But I think after second surgery, when you removed the band as well, what you could have done is just waited because, as you said, the uh, FTT was completely free. So I would have probably still waited. I know the problem here is to explain it to the patient. Now the first surgery, since you did not get anything. I don't know how you're confused, but uh, I, I want to know how you manage the patient once you once in the first post-op day there was absolutely no improvement at all, and then you were just supposed to face the patient and then ask for a second surgery. And after doing the second surgery, it's a difficult call whether to add the SRT in the same session or not. Um, but I would have still left it as it is and taken SRT in a different plan. I would have probably explained to the patient that the OS case is a is a is a very different case and is a little challenging case and i would have left it at just the insertion disinsertion of the band and disinsertion of the mr that you had earlier recessed and gone for a second stage later uh we usually prefer srt in lvbi most of the consultants here they, they prefer the superior crest transposition the one reason being that we don't want uh, to open the, we do usually phonic space so we don't want to open the conjunctiva so much so it's pro purely our uh, surgical technique that is why we do it but yes you can go ahead with nishida as well as partial vrt like uh, i believe as stomatologists we have a lot of options at hand uh, there are hundreds of ways to reach orthotropia which you did and you did pretty well um, you can just take any of the routes you want um, uh, that's it but it's a really interesting case so how did you manage the patient what did you tell the patient the next day The, the father just wanted her daughter to get married so i told ki i, I, told, I, I, I told the father ki i want her to get married more than you so that's how i got the reservation so they invite you for the wedding later <laughs> i hope so <laughs> no but it's a good case for uh, i mean you know it's something that we all had to sit and think about it's not, yes very interesting not something that is just oh. ashwini have you seen uh, something similar i mean not similar something similar ah. सर मैं तो आरपीसी में जितना देखा था उसी टाइम में ही देखा था अभी यहाँ पे तो ऐसे मतलब तो के केस अभी तक लास्ट मंथ्स में मैंने देखा नहीं so i think one of the things is definitely you know we must utilize our tools which is the ftt which is the afgt because it does give us a sense of what is happening and exactly. this is something that you can easily do in the opd on the bedside 
I mean, I have used it, uh, you know, multiple times to uh, to assess, you know, and this is particularly more so in things like six nerves or, you know, when I'm when I'm not sure how the abducting force is, and you do get us, you do get a fair idea, even if the, you know, even if the MR is tight, even if you're getting a positive FGT, AFGT can still give you a certain clue, but I'm not sure again here, you know, how much it really, I mean, how much that would have changed the uh, surgical technique any which way because we were not touching the uh, the idea was to do the SRT anyway because we figured the AR was not doing its job. No, no, so it did uh, appear. One thing, one thing I want to point out is I don't think this was a heavy eye syndrome in any way. Uh, one thing being the LR was right in its uh, position where you expected, and the other being the neuroimaging that we were talking about the plane. I, um, uh, this is, I, in my opinion, not the exactly the correct plane where we can talk about the. Um, orientation of the muscles. It should be somewhere around one centimeter or around nine to 10 mm in front of the optic nerve head and the globe junction. The reason being the angles that we talk about uh, that the Yokoyama, uh, that, Mr. that Dr. Yokoyama has suggested includes the centroid of the globe as well. And we all know that recti start a little nasally and as they progress forward, they become more and more lateralized. So probably if the, uh, the cut, the the cut which is like around one centimeter in front of the optic nerve head or the optic nerve in the globe junction would have been the uh, perfect place where we could have noted the orientation, kind of documented what exactly the orientation of the muscles should be. So I think Dr. Anu has another question. So she is asking application of, sorry, she is suggesting application of MMC can be tried in such tight muscles to avoid fibrosis. So that can be tried, right? So see, right. This is if we know. So if you know the previous case, which uh, Dr. Bhattacharya had operated, gave excellent results. So it's very difficult to predict which ones would give us a surprise like this. To... So that's. Uh, I just want to say something. I mean, on the on the first surgery, first stage. I mean, there was hardly any evidence of contracture, hardly any evidence of you know fibrosis. It, it seemed like a pretty much of like a normal medial rectus. I mean, on this photo, if you can see. This doesn't seem like too much of a tight, uh, you know, tight contracted uh, st you know, muscle. Uh, that's what I was assuming. Ki probably these were the band, these these faint uh, faint haze. These were the uh, the band. These were the structures which probably you know uh, became fibrosed and contracted later and became you know induced that scar. Another thought that comes to my mind is uh, three mm is not the normal position. Two mm, three mm is yeah. not the normal position for MR. Uh, this thing could it be a, a uh, how should I put it? Uh, a multiple head or bifid head of MR, one which we removed, the other being missed somewhere. I don't know. Uh, we, we could see up to 13 mm the slira, but the tinan that you could see, could it be the other head of the MR? Just, just thinking aloud. I don't know. What do the others think? This, uh, this could be a possibility. Even I felt so. So that could be quite ready. If you uh, look into Joseph L. Deemer's. Uh... MRI studies. So they have encountered a uh, by head or the splitting of the lateral rectus, even though that has only one ciliary vessel. MR has two ciliary vessels. So uh, MR bifid head, it's quite unusual. If it was there, we'd have seen some kind of segmentation or splitting in the uh, MRI image. So that is not there. It could be there, but it's quite rare. I agree. So I think one of those cases which we will we'll probably have to really sleep over now that we've seen <laughs> But thanks. I think we are almost out of time. Yes, uh, so we'll, I request all the panelists and presenters and moderators to stay for a group photo at the end of the <laughs> session. Yeah. Yes, let's have the certificate for Dr. Subhajit and yeah. uh, Aarti. If you Good, can. can you please stop your screen share? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We'll just say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Subhajit. Yeah. Thank you for thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Ashwini. All the speakers have been great. Uh, a special thank you. Thank you. Meeting. He's uh Chuk Mahapi Center. He's the one who's not introduced himself there. And uh, we have the we have now so you know surfing the anterior segment, this session is coming to a close, but we have the uh, in the AIOC conference that's coming up, which is a virtual conference in June. On the 26th of June, we'll have a uh, the uh, surfing the anterior segment special session within the Yo Pavilion. 
so all of you are should uh, must give in your entries must give in your submissions as you can look at the uh, flyer here in cornea cataract glaucoma or strabismus and please send your entries in by the 10th of june and aarti and all of us will then look forward and choose the best entries and uh, look forward to an amazing session again very soon next month thank you and thank you aarti for putting this together and uh, thank thanks to the, the panelists amar dr pradeep dr amar and dr ashwini and all the speakers and all the participants who are here to hear i'm sure you know strabismus is something that kind of keeps the gray cells working and these cases were the ones which would do justice to that <laughs> all right and uh, good night everyone exactly yes. thank you good sir. night good night good sir wait for a group photo sir <laughs> <laughs> definitely sir wait for a group photo we still we still <laughs> have the audience with us uh, yes. i just request everyone